we have uh, in our midst uh, proven expert experts who have volunteered to educate us on the subject based on their experience, over 25 years experience in this area. So today we have Dr. Antonia Showumi. She's a pioneer female clinical and radiation oncologist in Nigeria. She also doubles as a lecturer at the College of Medicine in Luz. Dr. Showumi, you're welcome. We also have Mrs. Ebo Anozi. She's the founder CEO of Care Organization Public Enlightenment, popularly known as COPE, a comprehensive breast cancer resource provider for women, breast cancer survivors, and caregivers in Nigeria. She is a strong advocate for breast cancer outreach and community awareness with over 25 years experience. Mrs. Anozi, you're welcome. The polar is back. We also have uh, Mrs. Semira Ogunto uh, a breast cancer survivor. She's here as well to share her experience from start to finish, the early symptoms, how she was able to manage it, and how she was eventually saved from the deadly disease. You're welcome, Ms. Ogunto Ibo. This webinar, like I said, promises to be very impactful and insightful. So we enjoy all our customers and our female staff that have joined this webinar today to so please sit back and follow the conversation. Before we start, I would like to apologize uh, for our CEO, MD CEO not to be available here today. He had to quickly take a call, an impromptu call. He's actually in transit to Abuja, Abuja right now. Uh, he would have really loved to be part of the session. So I apologize on his behalf and on, behalf, on his behalf, as well as the leadership team, I welcome everyone to please um, participate today. Thank you. Uh, but before we go on to call on the panelists, uh, we also have Bukola Oluyadi, uh, Head Customer Engagement uh, uh, Unit. Uh, she would speak briefly on the overview of breast cancer awareness and why we have delved into this as a bank. Bukola Oliadi, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thank Good you. morning to all our participants. We welcome you. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you for joining us on a session that promises to open our eyes to um, knowledge because they say knowledge is power. Once we're equipped with, once we're equipped with information, then we can take action. Um, this morning, as Dink has rightly said, I'll be talking briefly about an overview of the breast cancer awareness and why we are doing this. October is the Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and it's usually marked with the publication and the spread of the wealth of information about breast cancer. In recent years, the outlook for women with breast cancer has improved considerably. This is due to increased awareness and opportunities for early detection. In line with this, our bank has scheduled this webinar aimed at heightening that awareness and helping more people to understand this and to stimulate conversations. They say sometimes difficult conversations are the ones that are, you know, we run away from, we don't want to have them, but it is time we take our destinies in our hands, we are informed and so therefore we can take the right decisions, even by way of lifestyle and every other thing. Uh, breast cancer is one of the most common cancers in women and one of the leading causes of death in women. In 2020 alone, more than 2 million women were diagnosed with breast cancer around the world. While there are technological advancements and innovations in the treatment of this disease, creating awareness remains a veritable tool in helping to prevent and reduce the occurrence of the disease. Webinars are important for us, for you and I, to help us engage, we drive awareness and we impart knowledge. It's also helping us to take those difficult conversations, to encourage ourselves on the journey and to listen to experts like um, Dr. Shoemi and Ms. Anuze, and even to listen to a testifier 
You know, when you hear other people speak about an experience, you don't need to start reliving that experience all over again. The speakers we have have expertise, they have experience, they are strong in the area of advocacy, diagnosis, caregiving, and treatment of breast cancer. It will ensure that we have an all-rounded in, in, in session, and I encourage that the point of question and answer, we all participate, we ask those difficult questions, and we go away from this place enlivened, empowered, and able to go ahead and take action. At this point, I'd like to hand over to Binke again to take on with the proceedings. Thank you everyone again for joining us and see you at the end of a very nice and bright session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bukola. Thank you. Um, I think uh, without more to do, I'll just go straight and call on Dr. Antonia to please uh, take us on the journey. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, um, I feel honored to be here to share with you a bit of my experiences, knowledge about them, what you need to know about them, breast cancer. Next slide, please. Yes. You know, usually the first thing people will say is that, um, what do you really mean by cancer? And um, the simple way to explain it in the layman's language is to say that um, when from conception in our mother's womb, cells okay. continue to grow, even when we are born up to adulthood. And um, usually there is a connection between the brain and the different parts of the cells in our bodies. This pathway, the signal from the brain to the different parts of the body, the cells, organs, tissues, when it gets to the maximum point of growth, the signal from the brain controls it and will say, oh, let's say, for, for example, the breast. You've gotten to your maximum point of growth, stop, and the breast will obey. But in cancer, this pathway is usually being disrupted. And what happens is that when the breast is growing and there's a signal from the brain saying, stop, the cells in the breast does not obey that and it continues to grow uncontrolled. So that is the simple, and that happens for every part of the body. So you can have cancer from the head to the sole of the feet, every tissues, every organ, even vessels can be cancerous. And of course, now we know it's become a health problem worldwide. Cancer, it's a global body. Cancer respects no one. Children have it, adults have it. And there are lots of mystifying facts and myths. People confuse themselves and those around them with things they really don't understand. And um, especially in Nigeria, where we are very, very superstitious. So it's good to have a good knowledge about cancer and dismiss some of the misconceptions about the disease. Next slide, please. Of course, before we go on, we have to talk about the statistics. Globally, we have 18.1 new, 18 million new cases. And of course, out of that, we have 9.6 million cancer deaths. And this was the statistics in 2018. It has increased over time. And um, of course, cancer is common in sexes and um, Lung cancer is the most common followed by breast cancer. 
we have prostrate colorectal. Now we come to Nigeria. In Nigeria, we see about 100,000 new cases of cancer. And of course, we know that um, Nigeria in particularly, a percentage of cancer generally, it's about 20% of the population of Africa. And um, of course, when we think of that, it's a high incidence and statistics for us. Next slide, please. Of course, like we'll say, at times look at some of these statistics and um, you're hearing a million and it doesn't make much meaning to you. So we say like in Nigeria, we have some of, some of the challenges of not having a proper or a well standardized and um, organized cancer registry where we have records like they have in the developed country. But of course, you know, years back, it's been seen that um, we have, you know, more cancers in the female than the male. And maybe some say the reason could be because the female present early or go regularly to the hospital and so they can be detected. And when you talk about it, what the statistics, the millions, millions we've been calling simply says in bringing it back to us as individuals, it simply means that one in every five men and one in every six women worldwide will develop cancer before the age of 75. And one in eight men and one in 12 women will die from the disease. So when you look at that, one in um, five and one in six, you begin to wonder that is coming close to us as individuals in our homes, you know, friends. And um, next slide, please. Now we go to breast cancer, which is what we have for today. That was just, you know, an introduction to tell you about cancer generally. Breast cancer is the commonest female, you know, the malignancy in female. And um, we have about um, 570,000 new cases, right, worldwide each year. And that is about 18% of all cancer cases. Of course, people, most people know about breast cancer being mainly for the female, but the truth is that um, men also have breast cancer. The percentage is small, the incidence is small, about 0.2%. And so when they have it, it's usually more aggressive. So it's not only female can have breast cancer. And um, of course, as we all know, is the foremost cause of death, right? Worldwide, even in Nigeria, in terms of female cancer. Next slide. In Nigeria, it used to be the second incidence, but now it's the commonest. And the age range is between 30 to 50 years old, and um, it accounts for 42.6%. Of course, when we bring that down to statistics, that means that 116 cases of breast cancer is seen in every 100,000 women per year. So that will make you understand better about the incidence. Usually it's read before the age of 20 years. And a lot of people ask the question and they say, what causes breast cancer? To be honest with you, till date, globally, despite all the innovations and the researches, the reason or the cause remains largely unknown. But there are established risk factor. Next slide. What do we mean by risk factors? In simple terms, research has been done on a lot of people who had breast cancer and they tried to find the common grounds or the things that were common to them that made them have breast cancer. That was why they came out and called it risk factors. Basically, it's divided into three broad groups. We have the endocrine, the genetic, and the environment. When we talk of the endocrine, 
stroke hormone factors, it means that the age at which we start menses, which is our menstrual period, which is menarche, and the time that we stop is a contributory factor. We usually say there is what we call a window. And what happens in that window is that estrogen is being implicated in menstrual circle. And because it's being implicated, the longer the period, which, you know, when you're having menstrual period and it's been repeated, you find out that it also has an effect on the women and could, you know, kind of um, activate or make the breast um, cancer increase the hormone, which is being implicated in breast cancer. Of course, the age at first pregnancy, usually it's being said that it's best to, you know, have your first baby between the ages of, um, in the early days, they used to get pregnant at 18, but now because of education, you say that at least have your first pregnancy before age 25. And um, that helps. Of course, there's also the issue of parity, the number of children you have. And usually they say, oh, the um, more um, children you have, that there's a likelihood of um, probably having the breast cancer. That is controversial anyway. Then there's the use of contraceptive, either the hormonal injection or the oral. And um, there's the argument that some say yes for that, some say no. But what happens is that like the general consensus is that one must have had the tendencies or be on the borderline of risk factors of things that could cause breast cancer, which now becomes aggravated or initiated when you take the contraceptives. We go to the genetic and familiar factor. It's been discovered that it runs in the family. And of course, there is a gene that is implicated, and that is what we call BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Of course, 10% of those who have breast cancer uh, have it running in the family. We also have the issue of people who have had some, you know, what we call no, harmless, in medical term, we we'll call it benign breast disease. Some have mastitis, some just have different types of, you know, breast disease. Then we also have there is a relationship between having endometrial cancer, which is cancer of the womb or ovarian cancer, right? That some of them along the line, they have there's this relationship, them developing breast cancer, or some who have breast cancer along the line after many years of treatment could also develop endometrial cancer, which is cancer of the womb or ovarian cancer. And then for those who have never been pregnant because of the estrogen implication, which is not disrupted and continues, those are the things that um, are implicated in all the risk factors. Now we go to environmental factor. Geographical location has a role to play. There are some regions that the ground or the environment kind of emits a lot of radiation. And also we have them in places where bombs have been used, nuclear explosion, and a lot of this imaging that we do for diagnosis, either CT, um, X-rays, they been implicated to have some increased exposure to ionizing radiation. And that's why there's some people that you know have this phobia and it's like every little thing every month even twice a month they're either having um chest x-ray done one form of ultrasound one for things that you know radiate ionizing radiation but normally when it's been done at let me allay your face i don't want you to say that oh because of that when you go to the hospital and you're being advised to have a CT done, you now say, oh, I might have breast cancer. No, but of course we all know before such things come out and it's being used such investigations, it's research has been done that it is therapeutically safe. And because of that, 
right? You can do it at intervals, being guided by your um, medical personnel. Then alcohol intake has been associated. Also, we have those with high socioeconomic status you, um, also have breast cancer. They seem to say that a lot of them, that's controversial. Then we have obesity and diet. That's why we say a lot of times, try to watch your weight, especially as you grow older, try to eat healthy diet. And then one good thing about you know, breast cancer is that um, breastfeeding is protective against breast cancer. And that's why we advise the um, young ones that are still reproducing. A lot of people now have this notion amongst them when you talk to them. Oh, some of them will say, I don't want my breast um, to fall. I don't want, I want it standing straight. But we forget that God originally, that ordained breast milk has a purpose for it. Until date, there's nothing that can replace the um, supplements and the nutrition of breast milk. We go to symptoms and signs. What do you see? Usually, the first thing you could see is a mass or a lump in the breast, and it's usually painless at the initial stage. You look at your breast, you know, usually the two of them, you should, what I would say at this point in time, when you look at your breast, the two of them should be similar in size. There is a slight difference in one breast being bigger than the other, if you look very well, if you're someone who is very observant. But what we say to people is that you should know your breast. So you're being advised every month, look at your breast, look at it in the mirror and see. So when you know how your breast looks normally, when there's any change in anything, you'll be able to detect it. There could be change in the skin and you know, either you notice that it has some dimplings, things like, you know, the back of the orange, right, around it. You could see wounds, you could press your nipple and have discharge. But this discharge from the nipple, it's not, it's bloody or kind of colored. So you use like a white tissue or you use a cotton wool when you see any colorless discharge due to prolactin, especially for those who have delivered, even some who have delivered, but that is harmless. But it's always good if it's colored or if you're not sure, see your physician. There is, you know, at times you could have a lot of itching, burning, erosion, and then your nipple, instead of coming out, will go inside. That is what we call retraction. For some people, there's no mass in the breast. It could just be the armpits that they find a mass there. Like we always say, it's painless. And then you will have, you know, generalized swelling of the arm or breast. Next slide, please. Then when it's advanced, because some people see the signs and they ignore them. And of course, the cancer will not wait to continue spreading. So for the advanced stages, you discover that they start having pain, severe pain in the breast due to the swelling that is increasing. And of course, when it spread to other areas at the advanced stage, it will come down, there could be cough, shortness of breath, bone pain, you know, yellowness of the eye that could be spread to the liver, spread to the brain, dizziness, coma, irrational behavior or incoherent, you know, talk, or even fractures, um, this thing in the bone. Now, why I used this, right? is to just show you a pictorial diagram to show you what it means. Yes, we would have seen use the black, a black person, but usually it's clearer with a fair person. So if you look at the breast, this is what we say, knowing your breast, right? You see there's a color discoloration here and it's getting bigger. It doesn't mean that every color discoloration is a breast cancer, but if you notice, it's a telltale sign for you to say, oh, I need to follow up this aggressively and know exactly what is happening. You will see, right, that this nipple is not pointing out. It's going inside. Maybe before you know that your nipple was outside and suddenly it's been retracted, going inside. So you need to check it out. Next slide, please. Look at this now. It's obvious looking at these two breasts. That's why I say, look at your breasts, right? You can see something is going on here. It's different from the way this is the normal breast. And when you notice, because some people are there, they see these things, they ignore it, and it gets what gets to this stage. So I'm admonishing everybody to please, once you notice something, 
you know, it's good for you to go. Now, this is just showing you that you press the nipple. You will see here that there's a discharge. I've spoken about it. At least consult, you know, your doctor. Next slide, please. Treatment. Now we come to treatment. What does it entail? For the treatment, you have surgery. Usually, most times when we see a mass, we have to take a biopsy to find out, is it a harmless lump or is it a harmful lump? The harmless lump is what I call benign, while the harmful lump is what I call the cancer, cancerous lump, malignancy. They call it at times, it could be malignant. So that is the first thing of surgery. Then, depending on the stage at which the person presented, if present very early, we could just take out the lump and make sure that the area surrounding it, all the cancers around that area is gone, but it is dependent on the size. Then we could either remove the whole breast. We have what we call chemotherapy. It's a combination of injections that is for the cancer treatment. So they are anti-cancer drug treatment. We have what we call radiotherapy. This is using ionizing radiation to treat the breast after surgery, right, and chemotherapy so that the primary site of where the breast has been removed or where the lump has been removed, there will be some residual which are microscopic and they need to be treated. And it's the ionizing radiation, which is radiotherapy that will do that. We have what we call hormonal therapy, that basically tablets, because when you are diagnosed and when you finish treatment, you might have to put on tablets, hormone therapy for a period of five years to 10 years. And then this monoclonal antibodies, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, they're just new advancements that have been made, new drugs that are there. They are quite expensive, but they're also effective. Next slide, please. And um, what um, I would like to say, like we say, some facts to note when on treatment for breast cancer, because people come in at times, they say, oh, I don't want to cut my breast. Let me talk about the myths. I don't want to cut my breast. They say, when you cut my father or my mother or the generation I read, or I, if the stories were passed on to me, when I cut my breast, it will not heal because it's a fatty thing. Or when I cut my breast and um, I die, um, when there's reincarnation, I will come with one breast. And the question I normally ask them, have you ever seen anybody come with one breast? Who has ever, who have you seen? Is there any evidence? Have you ever seen people that cut their breast and it has not healed? So those are some of the myths that we say misconceptions. And then when you're on treatment, yes, people also go on and say, especially with the chemotherapy, they said, oh, I hear once you take chemotherapy, you're going to die. It's not true, right? I'm not saying that it doesn't shake you, but what I tell people is that look at the goal in front of you. What do you want to achieve? You want to achieve cure, you want to survive. And so definitely it's a hurdle you have to cross. It's going to shake you a bit, but it's what can be tolerated and it's what can be done. So if you prepare, you have that mindset and you're willing to accept it. Thank God we have a survivor who will tell you her story. And then, you know, the some of the notes said, when you are on the um, anti-cancer drugs, do not breastfeed. When you wait, when you finish treatment of um, chemotherapy, you have to wait for like all, um, breast cancer for like about two years before getting pregnant. Because the reason being that most breast cancer recall in the first two years after treatment, there are people who have, who have had breast cancer and finished, completed their treatment and still have had issues, you know, children after that. And one thing I'll say, early presentation is the key to survival and cure of breast cancer and all cancers generally. I say living is a personal choice you alone can make. You have the right to enjoy your life amidst challenges. There's no body in this world that doesn't have challenges. So it's your decision to choose right. Next slide, please. And what are the advice? What are the preventive measures for this breast cancer? We say, do a self breast examination every month. And that was why I said, you need to know what your breast looks like. You look at it in the mirror regularly so that when you see anything strange that was not there before, I mean, you get alerted and you can go to see the physician. And usually we say, 
this breast self self breast examination should be done a week after menstruation simply because two weeks to menstruation there are some hormonal changes you have a lot of water retention in your breast if most of us who have had uh, who have periods you realize that about two weeks to at times your breast even the bra that you wear hurts you even just touching your breast can be painful at times is due to the hormonal changes and the fluid collections or the retention of fluid in that breast that causes it. So your breast becomes very lumpy before menses, but a week after it's less lumpy. So you can easily pick up anything there when you are palpating or examining your breast, feeling it. Then once you're 40 years and above, you do a yearly mammogram for three years, three consecutive years. And if negative, you can do it every two years. If you have a family history, you should do start your mammogram earlier and you know, see the doctor so that if you're not too sure, you could have a regular physical breast examination. And once you notice a lump or anything, if you go to one doctor and you're not satisfied, you could go to another doctor or ask for specialists, at least to be sure and to allay your fears. And if there's need for you to be treated, the earlier you start, you know, a stitch in time saves nine. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Facts to note, live a healthy lifestyle and exercise. Do not live in denial when diagnosed. Remember that health is wealth and the key to cure is early presentation. Remember, knowledge is half the battle. Action is the other half. Next slide, please. These are just to show you, I couldn't um, take out some of this. Like I said, these are the type of things we see for those who live in denial because the little lump becomes this. And when this kind of a person, I'm sure you can see my cursor comes into your room, the whole place is stinking because the breast has become fungating and smelly, right? You can see here, that just to show that any part of the body, like I said earlier on, can have cancer, this is cancer, this is another, right? And all these people, over 70% of our patients in Nigeria present late in forms like this because they would have first gone to the herbalist, gone for alternative measures, gone for so many things. And then when they see there's no help, after they've been drained of their finances, they get pushed out and then they now start coming to the hospital for orthodox treatment. By the time they get there, they don't, have the money anymore and it's usually advanced and so when it's advanced the chances of survival of cure is nil so all we can do a better quality of life until you know time comes no death is in the hand of the lord the next one you can see this right as well and there are some people please decide before this this right there are some that come in and like they say, if it runs in the family, some will say, even if it doesn't run, some will say, I don't want the breast. Since having breast tissue is part of it, like this woman did, and she has removed it. Thank you for listening. Wow. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much. This is really an eye opener. And I'm sure you'll be shocked to know that this is my first time of actually sitting down and listening to any form of education on breast cancer because it's so scary to me. So it's not something I never wanted to be part of. You know, I'm a normal Christian. I'm always like, God forbid, it's not my portion. I don't want to know. But I think it was a wrong uh, uh, attitude towards this. Like you said, knowledge is the first half of treating this breast cancer. So thank you so much. Uh, for our participants, I know you have a lot of questions to ask uh, uh, the doctor. But I think we should listen to the three of them so you can then put all your questions together. So you either raise your hand or you send in your question as a chat. Thank you, doctor. So participant, please hold your question and let's listen to um, Mrs. Arnold J. Remember, hold on please. Mrs. Arnold J is the CEO for CORE. She has been working with patients, stakeholders, and everyone to drive the breast cancer awareness. So she's seen it all from those who survived it, from those who are at their early stage, and also 
different people's perspective to what the cancer is or how it affects their life. So we'd like to tap in into her experience as well to take us on what she has seen so far in her 25 years of experience and her word of advice for us. Mrs. Anazi, over to you. Good morning. Morning, once again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I can hear you. I've actually been dancing around the house because of network in Abuja. It was pretty yeah, yeah. So I'm going to take. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. You can go ahead, madam. Okay. Um. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Edwola Anozi. I'm the CEO of um, the organization Public Enlightenment. It's a breast cancer non-profit comprehensive breast cancer resource provider for women, breast cancer survivors and caregivers. Um, it was established in 1995 and we've been dedicated to reducing the mortality rate of breast cancer in Nigeria through screening, hello, counseling, can you hear me? This is great. Yes, go ahead, Ma, we're hearing you. Uh, referrals, education, enlightenment, and nurturing. That's um, what we have actually been doing. Next slide, slide please. And um, a reason led us to this. Um, like I always say, I lost both my parents to cancer. I had breast cancer scare. That was how hope came about. And what we basically do, thanks to Polaris Bank, We've been able to start screening with the machines that you gave us. I'm getting another one, thank you, thankfully. Uh, we do breast screening every um, third Saturday of the month. We pray that a lot of women will come, come in 2022. We found out that women come when it's late. You, I heard uh, Dr. Tonya say that, um, show me. So, we encourage women to please avail themselves to screening. It is very important. Early detection is key. We do outreach campaigns as well. We have been to more than 10 states in, in Nigeria. Yeah, we have the support group. The support group is for those women who have had, who are the will to, we teach them, they call them that um, there's life after breast cancer. What we basically do is make sure that um, they, they tap strength from each other and they regain their self-esteem, which is quite important because um, some people feel that without a breast, you cannot leave. That is totally wrong. We have people who have, my vice president is a 23 years of um, breast cancer survival and she's living her best life. Then the counseling is very key, which we do on Fridays by appointment. We make sure that um, when people come, which is a special day for us in the office, they come with their family members and counseling is done. Very, very important. It's the same thing as we are showing that there is life after we have mastectomy done. We have um, the Breast Cancer Information Center as well, where university students make use of. Some of them come from different um, countries. Some come from Nigeria here. The last person we had was from South Africa. She's come back, went back last, um, last month. And um, the library is, um, please, I have to make sure you're still, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Beautiful because I keep getting this um, low bandwidth, you understand? So I want to make sure that you can still hear me. Then we have the we library can. as well. We make referral services. Okay. Then we have the medical support services, which is um, where when the women have um, mastectomy done, we make available breast prosthesis, which um, they can use to augment the diseased breast that they have removed. And it's a special um, kind of bra. I will show you along um, as I go on. Then we also 
still have, um, like I said, volunteers. We have volunteers. Some women make sure that they train their children. Some parents, I should say, make sure that they train their parents to volunteer. So they bring them to us. So when we are having more giving back to society, and then we have um, what I'm doing now, speaking engagements and consulting. We do that. Unfortunately, I wish I, I was in Lagos. And next slide is, hello? Yes, we're uh, hearing you. Okay, the well woman. Um, Dr. Shomi has spoken about um, this, so I don't want to take much of your time. Next slide, please. That's the, uh, a woman's place. Next, next one, please. Okay, she's done this as well. There's, there's a perfect breast. Next slide. She's done this as well, which is um, how cancer starts. A lot of people are ignorant over how it starts. Just yesterday, it's a healthy soul. Just yesterday when we had the meeting, um, International Cancer Week meeting, we were told about, um, we we're informed about how well, I'm sure Dr. Shomi is listening, how well oncologists should prepare themselves because of the ways and the medications that people, um, breast cancer and um, cancer survivors use. Because there are times you will see that some family members have um, cancer in their families. That's a, the percentage of those who have it is less than 10%. Because when people are going through radiation, it is important that family members or people who are caregivers do not move close to them because of the medication that might emit some rays and um, chemicals that might affect them as well. So we got to know that and we talked at length about it. That there's a continuation today. She's talked about being those early menstruation before the age of 12, late menopause, age after 55, that's how you can late birth, having one's first um, baby after the age of 30, those are the predisposing factors. If I reel out everything, it does not necessarily mean that once you are here, you would have it. It's not one size fits all. So being overweight, it's important that you exercise, very, very important. Make sure you exercise every day. The environment she talked about, uh, the pollution, chemicals, occupational hazards, long usage of contraceptives, because I listened to what she said, and personal history. Um, there are times whereby you have a personal history. Maybe you know that one's grandmother, grandmother, and you definitely know when it's in the family. That's when it's important for women to have their breast screened. Because I remember I started screening early, but I didn't do mammogram early. I was advised not to do it since it's not a hereditary factor in my family of breast cancer. So I did it when I was 40. The reason is because if you're younger, the density, the, um, the density of your breast is very important. Your breasts are still dense and the, the mammogram might not read it, might not be able to see anything. So if you're 40, just give yourself that birthday gift and have a mammogram done, please. But you can avail yourself to a breast ultrasound scan and make sure you do your um, breast self-examination, which is very, very important. That's why we are available third Saturday of every month to help women discover breast cancer early. Now, um, women who take menopausal hormonal, um, who go through the hormonal therapy, which um, Dr. Shomi talked about as well, and then the radiation therapy exposure to the chest, which she talked about as well. Next slide, please. Then she said also what um, symptoms of breast cancer, you have um, when one breast is unusually bigger than the other. I must say it is very important that you take care of your breast. A week after your menstruation, please stand in front of the mirror and see if one breast is unusually bigger than the other. The breast, both breasts are not the same size. Because most importantly, when you want to go and buy your shoes, 
remember that one size of the shoe might fit while the other might not, might be tight. The parts, our body parts are not equal. But if you notice that unusually it is bigger, then please make sure you go and visit the doctor. If you have a bloody discharge from the nipple, inverted nipple, when the, because I saw the picture where, when she showed it, Dr. Shon, she said, once you have your nipple being inverted, is receding, please do not take any chances. Just make sure, don't, don't wait until something bad happens, or maybe you now start having a foul smell. You have to go to the hospital and check it out. If you're not impressed with what the doctor is telling you, please go to another doctor until you're satisfied. Then if your breast starts looking puckered, like an orange peel, that's very important. You have to look at your breast. You look at your breast lovingly, you check carefully, and then you, you make sure that everything that is not supposed to be there, take note of. Then if you have any tingling sensation or your breast becomes itchy, like I always say, please, a woman is supposed to wear one bra a day. Once you wear your bra in a day, you're not supposed to wear it anymore. You have to wash it and pick a new bra. It's very important because of hygiene, because of sweat, and then you probably might have put perfume. It's important that you change your bra every day and your underwear. And anything unusual you find, please make sure you take note of it and you can con come to our center and have a check. Now, when you perform your breast self examination, which is key, at this point, the size, why we say you check your breast a week after your menstruation is because at that particular time, the size, texture, and shape of your breast will have come back to normal, which is very, very important. If you check before that time, because I've had a situa many situations where a woman is about a week or two to menstruating, then she comes for um, her check. And then you might probably find an unusual thing happening. It might be synonymous to the, um, her menstrual cycle. So a week after your menstruation is the best time to check your breast. You have your breast cells and you do it every month because it early fully. detection <laughs> is answer. And I have another, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, um, diagno diagnostic methods and lumps. We have talked about that. You have clinical breast examination, mammogram. You have um, what? He has said, and which I'm going to reiterate is the fact that because not all lumps in the breast are cancerous, but once you find out that you even have a, you see, all lumps must be proven innocent until you now find the lump guilty. And you cannot do that without removing that lump that is suspicious for histology, which is very key. So malignant is what we call a threat to life. And that is what we call cancer. If not checked, we have people who go early and they're still leaving. So if not checked and you leave it to chance and say, oh, it will go away, wish it away. I'm sorry, it might become something that you might not be able to handle in future. Then we have the fibrodenoma, the fibroid cyst, which is not cancer, and it is also advisable to remove it. Now, I'd like to let you know that there's some, there's some people who have more than one breast lump in, in, in um, more than one breast lump. And when that happens, in lungs, we find that anything they find that, um, we've had situations like, I'll give you a very good analyzation as well. She had one lump checked, she had two lumps, one was checked, it was benign, there was nothing wrong with it. And the pathologist wanted to throw away the samples. And he just had a second thought that, let me just check the second one. And it was cancerous. That was how her journey started. And thankfully, she's living her best life today because she caught it early. Now, those are the machines that we use for mammogram. You can see the person in green, of course, is me with my breast in there. They flat doing my mammogram as usual. 
but I don't do it every, I don't do it every year. For me, I do it once in three years, but I make sure that I do the breast self ultrasound scan and my breast self examination, monthly breast self examination. It is very important. Next slide, please. Now, um, Shoshi must have spoken about the tips for having a successful mammogram. I'm going to run through that. Pick a good time. It could be a week after your menstruation. You go prepared when you're going for any breast screening. Wear a blouse you can easily remove so that you don't remove, you don't expose your entire body. Do not use anything under on your underarms or breasts, such as lotion, deodorant, talcum powder, or perfume. They might, the, the, the analyst might mistake in it for a lump, so you have to be very careful. And identify a certified facility that is used frequently. This is very, very important. Please just don't use a place that somebody says. You have to make sure that you are aware that it is a good place. Then gather information about what mammogram is all about, your family and personal medical history. Avoid taking any liquid that contains caffeine before you go. Don't drink um, Coke, Fanta, things like that. Just make sure that you probably just take juice. Complement, complement it with um, an ultrasound or sonogram scan. And um, make sure you go for your results and keep it so that you can compare. In my lifetime, I, have, I think I've had about six or seven mammograms done, I think six. And I always compare. Once I'm going to have my mammogram done, which of course I think we'll, I'll do that next year. I take all my results so that if there's anything unusual happening and they notice, they will, I will quickly do the need for. Next slide, please. Now, um, Dr. Shomi has spoken about the stages of breast cancer, which I found very interesting. Next one, please. Um, she talked about treatment choices. You have surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and immunotherapy. So those are the things you can see the woman who's getting her chemotherapy up there. And these are the side effects of, um, of um, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, of course, you know that it's poison being um, inserted into the body to fight cancer cells. As the, good, uh, the bad cells are being fought, they definitely will affect the good cells. So while you do that, while you're doing that, we tell women before they have the chemotherapy done that they should please cut their hair short because you might have alopecia, which is that you lose your hair. That's a picture of somebody who's lost her hair. A lot of women lose their hair. So you don't want to have your hair. And then when you have chemotherapy, you will now have your, a chunk of your hair being, you know, coming off. It's, it definitely would affect you. So you have nausea, you have weakness, fatigue. People feel like throwing up, you know, color skin, this color of uh, and skin, the tongue will change. You have lack of appetite, shortness of breath, diarrhea, dehydration, constipation, fever, headache, rashes, vomiting. Like I said before, please, not one size fits all. Some people just make it through without anything, um, anything that would affect them negatively. It's just some of them just feel fatigued. Some of them definitely, some lose their hair. Some say they don't lose their hair. So it's not one size fits all. So we have to be very careful. But during this period, I always say to people, use our local uh, the beta uh, twin stick when you want to wash your um, teeth so that you don't you bring out all the, um, the, the, the smell of the uh, chemotherapy, the, the drug is very important. And then I say to them, it's important to use a uh, ori the local we um, share water to for your skin so that your skin will look like a baby skin. It's important. And then you eat as much as possible to the ground, eat a lot of vegetables and, um, and fruits. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please.
Mrs. Anazi, are you still there? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, I'm still here. It was my dog. I couldn't hear. Uh, should I continue or go back? Yes, continue. You're on the healing page. When did you lose me? I think uh, you just asked for the next Okay, line. then yeah. we have healing. Are you there, Mrs. Anazi? Bukola, are you hearing her? No, I'm not. I'm sure she just, let me check. Um, she's still on the call. In fact, she's speaking, but it's not, um, it's not audible or rather, her mic is not moving, but she's there. Oh, she's off now. Okay. Okay, no, no, she's okay. still there. Let's call her and see whether I'm sure she's having net of issues. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. It's okay. The network, the network in Abuja is pretty bad. So you have to deal emotionally as well, mentally and spiritually. Okay. Don't so please don't have the notion that it's somebody that is doing me. Just make sure that you do the needful. You feel you are the same person. So it's very important. Then um, we have the five um, out is um, when you're told that you have breast cancer, these are the things you go, you go through. You react negatively. You probably say, why me? You resist the, the news that it's not be me. Later, the reality sets in. You resign into your faith that this is, uh, you know, into your faith that this is what is happening to me, and then you you reorganize your life. Next slide, please. Now, um, these are the things I just talked about earlier on. So, um, when cancer is, um, I'm talking about reaction. When you're told that one has breast cancer, you have shock, numbness, disbelief. The next thing is you resist your honey to cry you say why me you're you're scared of the of what is going to happen the reality eventually sets in you now take it and then the next thing you come withdrawn you probably feel isolated and eventually you reorganize your life and start living a normal life so that's just part of what we're saying the final is so um the most important thing is when this has been done you talk about it, what do we do now? The family will ask, what do we do now? Making decisions is important. Let's talk about it. You know, one healing oneself, and then you start living a new normal life, which is very, very important. Um, these are the, this is how the biopsy is made, the histology, where the sample of the so biopsy, and then the result comes out. Next slide, please. That's, um, I don't think we need this. Dr. Shomi has shown quite a lot of it. So we can skip this one and the other one. These were women that I saw at the at my center. Next slide. We can just see that breast changes. Hello, next slide, please. Hello? This can I have the next slide? Next slide, okay. This is what we're talking about when we say, please, could I have the previous one? Let me have the previous one, thank you. Hello? This, yeah, this is, um, you have the one, that, that's the uh, breast, the silicone breast. Can I please talk on the previous one? Hello? Can I have the previous slide? Yes, this is the um, silicon breast and then that's the bra. So when one part of the one breast is removed, you can wear the prosthesis. So next slide, 
this the silly the breast comes into the bra has been removed she uh, would be you feel comfortable that you have your breast back and the times we have those who have double mastectomy which means that because i found a, um recently had a young girl who's removed her two breasts so she said that if she wants a bigger breast she can use a bigger Breast or small one, whichever one she likes. And I like her spirit. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, recommendations for cancer prevention be as lean as possible without becoming overweight, be healthy, physically active for at least 30 minutes every day. I say one hour every day. Avoid sugary drinks, you know. Um, all those um, things that um, we, we, we drink. Um, eat more of a variety of vegetables. You can mix ugu with okra, with, um, with different vegetables in one pot is very important. And you don't cook for too long. Your vegetables should be in the pot for less than two minutes, less than two minutes. Eat more, um, you now limit your consumption of red meat. As once you once you hit 40, please, you should not have meat in your plate. Eat more of fish and chicken. When you eat chicken, remove the skin. Exercise regularly, drink a lot of water, sleep well, make sure you're not carrying a baggage, you know, I'm talking about um, um, you having a lot of things you're worried about. It's very important and try as much as possible. Please stop bearing grudges. Stop bearing malice. It can hit you and you can become sick and have a problem with your health. It is very important. Anybody offends you, please just accept if they say sorry. If they don't, please move on. It's not the end of the world. Next slide, please. Those are the sugary things, drinks I'm talking about. You can see them. So recommendations, we have done that. And if consumed at all uh, with salt, don't try and uh, don't use supplements to protect against cancer. It's not going to work. You need to see your doctor before you go and use supplements. I always say this. You might be using a supplement that you have excess of. So please be very careful. Limit your salt consumption. It's best for you to breastfeed. We always encourage women to breastfeed. Breastfeed for one year, it doesn't really matter. It's very good, but at least six months. After treatment, cancer survivors should follow the recommendations which um, to limit cancer. Active means that please make sure that you do not give your life to chance. Have your breast like, so for mammogram if you're uh, above 40 or 40. And if you are not so sure, you can also go for MRI, which is a magnetic resonance image. I guess Dr. Sony talked about that as well. So don't leave your life to chance. Next slide, please. You can take alcohol. Nothing says you can't take alcohol. It's a lovely baby breastfeeding, a beautiful breast. You can take alcohol if you want to, but please don't get drunk and just limit your alcohol intake so that it does not distort or dis um, damage your kidneys, your intestines. So next slide, please. Breastfeeding is very important. Very, very important. I, I know that a lot of men ask me who owns the breast, whether the woman or the baby. So this is where you can find us, number 39B, Adeni Jones, Ikeja. Uh, we work from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's our email address. Our phone numbers are there. And our website, uh, we've just um, overhauled our website. We're still, it's, it's work in progress. And I'm sure that um, whatever it is we need to talk about if it comes to breast cancer, please do not hesitate to call us. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have you. any questions you want to ask? Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Anazi. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your 
experiences and knowledge with us. We really appreciate. Um, like I said earlier, for the participants, you will we will take your question immediately after uh, Ms. Ogutoibu. Uh, for me, she's very important for this session as we listen to uh, Dr. Shoumi and Mrs. Anozie. Uh, you know, I'm sure some of them sound very abstract and very far away and scary, especially for me. Like I said, it's my first time of ever listening to any presentation or talk on breast cancer because I was very scared of what people say about it. And thank God for the mantra that uh, Dr. Shoumi threw out today. I think it's very important. She said, knowledge is half the battle. That actually hits me. Knowledge is half the battle. So it's important that we're having this session and I'm so grateful to the MD and his leadership team for supporting this session and ensuring that we continue to empower our women health-wise as well as financial-wise. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to call on Ms. Semira Ogunto-Ibo. She's going to bring this down home. Down home, uh, uh, that is what the two presenters had said. She's going to tell us on how she first discovered it is it at the early stage or at the later stage? What were the things that she saw? What were the things that she did and how she was able to survive it? I'm sure we'll be able to connect with her very well because she is a survivor. She's not a medical doctor. She's not talking from a third party point of view. She is telling us what she has experienced personally. And we're so grateful, Ms. Obuto Inbu, for you voluntary, uh, volunteering to uh, share your experience with us. So can we hear from you, Ma? Ms. Sogunto Ibo. Okay, my video is not available. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, good can morning. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You can speak. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, you can enable my video as well. So good. <clears throat> you know when. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much, uh, Polaris Bank, for this for the difficult conversations um, around cancer, which. Um, it's usually very difficult, especially in an environment like ours. Thank you for bringing the awareness to people. And thank you very much, Dr. Shoumi, for the enlightenment on cancer. And thank you, Auntie Ebu uh, Anuzi. Thank you very much for what you do. Uh, people like me, survivors, are very grateful to you. So many people are not aware of what you do, how you know you stand in for us, hold our hands through this um, the journey. When we're down, you pull us up, you just stand in there with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, so sorry, Samira. Um, sorry, Hi. can you please um, enable your video? Is an um okay. 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 We would like to see the beautiful face. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Yes, it was not allowing me before. Okay. I'm trying. So thank you very much. And yeah. on a lighter note, my hair is not short because of chemo. It's just a hairstyle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my hair had grown. Yeah. It was very thank long. And yeah. I just decided to have a new look. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank so you. I. Once again, my name is Emira Okuto I am a mother. I have two lovely teenagers. I have 21 years of professional experience from banking to real estate. And recently I have added uh, life coaching because uh, of, the, of my journey and uh, the fact that I, I feel that I should bring my experience to help others. So my journey, I will just um, say it as raw as you know, it, 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 it was. 
and um, the journey started in 2014. So in 2012, yes, 2012, I was still working in Access Bank. I can remember I had, um, I, I did comprehensive, you know, medical checkup. And when I did, I did memogram. I was in my 30s. And like uh, Mrs. Anuji said, the, you know, the, the results came that the breast um, tissue was too, was too, um, well, the, 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 the result was inconclusive. And I could remember sitting down in front of the doctor and she just looked at it and she said, well, this is inconclusive, you know, something I can't remember exactly what she said, but it was dismissed. So I didn't, uh, it, the recommendation, from um, the diagnostic center was that I should go ahead and do a scan, but nothing was done. I just left it. So 2014, early 2014, I started feeling weak. I was just always tired, always feeling sleepy at work. And, you know, things were just not together with me. I wasn't together at all. I went to the hospital, I complained, you know, and then everything was, it was, well, there was no, major diagnosis. It was just that, oh, okay, maybe I should take time off or off work. And um, I went on vacation, came back in March. After like two weeks, I was tired again. And then um, on this particular day in April, I went to the salon. It was a nail studio. And a lady walked in and she was sharing flyers for, from healing, um, uh, healing stripes in Suruleri asking people to come for free breast screening. So I collected it and at the back, you know, self-examination was written at the back. I mean, the picture was uh, pasted at the back. So when I got home that evening, I picked it and I said, okay, let me do this thing. I can remember maybe I'd done it, uh, I'd done it the year before, I didn't see anything. So I put my hand on my left breast. And as I put the hand, I just felt the thing. And I was like, what is this? I touched the right one. It was okay. The left one, there was just a big lump. And I just went blank. I just shut down. And I went to work again for another one week. I didn't even think about it. I just blocked it out. So on a particular, I think I was, about two weeks later, I was seated at my desk. And a friend of mine called me and I just mentioned it that, you know, you know, I was doing breast examination and I touched my breast and I felt a lump. And she said, so what have you done about it? I said, nothing. She said, how, can, how could you have not done anything? Get up now, I would follow you, pick me up in my office. Let's go to the healing stripes in Suruleri. So I went. She couldn't join me, so I went alone. And um, the examination was done, and I was asked to come back for scan. I went back for scan, and um, they told me it wasn't looking good, that I would need to do a biopsy. So that was done, and then the results came back, I think, about a week later. And you know, because I'm a Christian, the moment they said it wasn't looking good, I started praying. I really didn't share it with anybody beyond that, my friend. You know, I started praying, rejecting bad news and all that. So I went alone that day to get the results. And I sat in front of the doctor and she gave me the bad news. And I started crying. I literally broke down because I just, I, I could see the image of my two kids. They were six years old then, now they're 13. So I started crying and she said to me, you know, she tried to encourage me you know, that, you know, this is not a death sentence. If you don't take it that way, it's not going to be like that. She gave me different stories of people who were discovered at stage one, but they gave up. They didn't believe that, you know, anything could happen. Um, she gave a particular story of a particular lady that within a year, even though it was stage one or stage two, I can't really remember, you know, but that she literally gave up, you know, she didn't, she didn't um, think it was, she was going to leave, leave that cancer, cancer was death sentence. And that, you know, she had seen people stage three, 
you know, who are still alive, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, I was still crying. And she gave me the numbers of two survivors. So as I stepped out, I called one of them. And then she encouraged me. She was, she was even laughing that, oh, okay, you know, she was joking. And that encouraged me that, okay, so you mean you have gone through this thing, you've taken chemo, and you can still be laughing and smiling. And she said, well, I mean, it is what it is. You just have to be determined. You just have to uh, believe, you know, the word of God, that if God says you will live, you will live. Anyway, so I called the second person. She happened to um, be living not too far from the, from the hospital. So she said I should come to her house. I went to her house. She had just finished chemo. So by the time I spoke with her, too, I was encouraged. So from that point onwards, I decided that, okay, you know, I was going to face this. And by the grace of God, I was going to survive. So from there, I just, um, I think the next day I went straight to see the surgeon that was recommended uh, from the, uh, by the, by the doctor that gave me the diagnosis. So I, I went for surgery. I didn't, um, you know, I, I think some of the, some of the things that usually happen is that when people get the diagnosis, they, they don't um, talk to the right people from the beginning and then they start running around, running around and wasting time. Okay. So mine wasn't um, early stage. So I was lucky that God surrounded me with uh, good people, supportive people. So I went to see the doctor immediately. And then the following week, I just did the surgery. And then that was when um, family members got to know. So I did the surgery. And then my, my friend, the first person that I called, happened to be a member of COPE. So she introduced me to COPE. And I met... Um, Auntie Ebu, that's what I call Auntie, um, this is Ebu Anuzi, and then she encouraged me. It was, um, it was quite advanced at that time. So, of course, I, I, I had to take chemotherapy, which um, wasn't easy. But through it all, I was still going to work. You know, so I would take chemo, I would take four days off, take chemo. Um, be down for four, four days. By the fifth day, I'll be okay. Then I'll go to work. I think it was the sixth chemo that really was very, very bad for me. It was so bad that um, I could barely walk to the restroom. I used to crawl to the restroom. It was that bad. And um, I couldn't go to the sitting room and I couldn't go to work the fifth day like the other, like the, like the earlier ones. I think that one took me about two weeks to get up. And then the journey for the first um, cancer, because I've, I mean, I've had um, uh, a relapse. So the journey for the first one ended, I think uh, my chemo ended in October. But strangely, there was something that happened. My, the mastectomy sites did not heal until after I finished my chemo. I was still carrying the wound. I was still covering it. I was still um, going to work and trying to do every other thing that I was doing. And the, the strength for all that, I know it is not by my power. It is by grace. I call myself a child of grace. Um, God gave me so much grace and God blessed me with supportive family members, supportive people, um, I, I, I can't mention her name enough, um, Auntie Evo was always there, calls, you know, anytime I was down and I needed somebody to talk to, I would call her. And um, another thing is why, uh, for a long time, I wasn't telling my story, I wasn't coming out to talk. But, you know, after a while, I started thinking that, Samira, when you were down, when you you were struggling when you weren't sure of what was going to happen. You used to uh, search the internet to find out, okay, who has gone through this? What, you know, how did it go? Who can I talk to? So if you refuse to tell your story, if there's one person out there that, you know, um, needs to hear from you to be encouraged, 
you know, are you, you know, are you, are you going to continue to deny um, that one person? But I know that would be more than one person. So I said to myself, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? People will know that, you know, I have one breast. So, I mean, what you focus on, you know, is what is what is what is important. At the end of the day, it is all about the purpose for which God has created us. It is all about fulfilling purpose and finding fulfillment. That is what is important. It is not about the negative experiences that we've had. It is not about the traumas that we have gone through. Anyway, so the first journey ended, 2015, I was cool. I was going about my normal business. You know, once in a while, when I'm able to, I will go for the folk meeting. Um, you know, I, life, was, life was good. 2016, 2017, then 2018. About mid 2018, I started feeling funny. Um, I started having back pains. And then I went for checkup late 2000, and I think it was September 2018. And then um, um, discovered that, of course, I had, um, I had a mastitis, it had, um, you know, uh, cancer was discovered in some parts of my body. And I had to start medication again. So I went back, excuse me. So I started taking medication, um, which was oral uh, chemotherapy at this time uh, from 2018 to 2019. And then later that didn't um, appear to be working very well. Uh, that, that medicine made me very, though I'm, I'm dark complexion, but <laughs> I, I turned very black. You know, my, my palms were very black. I think it wasn't um, a very nice experience, but I still thank God that, of course, you know, that medicine still sustained me for a while. But 2019, um, late 2019, um, became, I became quite ill. I really was down. And then the medication was changed. Uh, so I was on medication till early 2020. And then uh, COVID came. I was still on medication when COVID started. But thankfully, uh, the medication worked by grace again. Like I say, uh, my journey, I know is by grace. So since 2020, when um, I started, uh, uh, you know, 2020 till date, now I'm back on my feet totally energetic. I'm able to go for my work, my one hour work every morning. Um, um, I've been able to start a new journey, start my own business. Um, I was in a real estate firm. I was an executive director in a real estate firm as at least um, 2020. So early this year, I started my own real estate firm. I started my coaching journey and um, I'm doing very, very well. I'm doing very well to the grace of God. Uh, so that's, um, that's my story so far. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, um, Ms. Um, Samira. Thank you so much. We're really grateful and um, we thank God for the strength and the boldness that he has given you to make yourself available for others to learn from it. So we're so grateful to God for his grace upon your life and we pray that the healing will be permanent by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So now we would go to the question and answer. And... Um, before we, I have some questions that people have sent to me directly, but I think we have two people who have raised their hands for a while. So that's Jennifer Agwaba. Jennifer, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? And mention the uh, panelists that uh, you are directing the question at. Jennifer, can you hear me? No, she didn't ask. It. Jennifer. Okay, so if Jennifer is not there, Salamatu also raised her hand. 
Salamatu, can you please ask your question or mute and ask your question? The host should please unmute Salamatu. Good Hello, morning. Salamatu, you're unmuted. Yeah, good morning to you all. Good morning. I'm grateful for this. I, it's kind of very educative. And my question is this. Hello? Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, my question is directed to Samira. Okay. Go ahead and ask the question. Okay, like I've understood how she uh, she battled, but how did she discover? Like at the first time she was diagnosed with breast cancer, how did she feel and how did she get over it? That's my question. Okay, Miss Samira, can you please take that question? Okay, of course, um, I felt very bad. I, like you said, after uh, I was encouraged by the survivors that I spoke with, when I got home, I, I began to feel like a victim. That's why me, you know? So for a long time, it was why me, you know? What, you know, why should I have cancer? Where is it coming from? Nobody has ever had it in my family, you know? So sometimes it was anger, Sometimes it was it was it was confusion, you know. So even though I was going through the treatments, I was doing what I needed to do, but you know, for a while I was confused. I was I was it was almost like I was lost. I was hiding um, from others, from my friends. A lot of my friends, apart from one single friend, didn't know what I was going through. So it was a period of confusion. The first time I was totally totally confused. Um, of course, you know, I had pastors that were praying for me and then uh, they gave me the word of God. They gave me scriptures to stand on. Um, but I won't kid you for a while, for some months, it was even a struggle to stand on those scriptures. Um, on, you know, gradually, gradually, I began to come out of it. But, you know, I won't say the strength, the, 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 the spiritual strength and the emotional strength came in later, it was much later as I began to, to listen to, you know, um, uh, words of encouragement, listen to um, uh, preachings on healing and gradually was able to stand on healing scriptures. And, you know, so it was a gradual process to get out of the victim mentality, to be able to focus on what God says about me. Um, and, um, you know, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm in the coaching space now. That's one of the things that are taking me into coaching because even the second time when, we, when it happened, I still went through the same journey. So, of course, you know, I then had to, you know, uh, get a professional coach and start dealing with a lot of um, the trauma because um, one of the things that I realized was that my soul was traumatized. You know, and I had to start dealing with the trauma, you know, um, through coaching and therapy. So that has really helped me um, to come to terms with what I have gone through and to be able to face um, the future, knowing that um, God is on my side and um, uh, that, you know, he has, he has given me wisdom and he has provided uh, a lot of solutions ahead for me to be who he has called me to be. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so I much. That help. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so there's a question from one Bukola Adiremi Ladigolu. Uh, she's directing her question to Dr. Shoumi. And she says, I know that early detection is key, but what of the saying that what you do not know would affect you? So she wants you to uh, 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 speak on that as well. She also would like to get 
more clarification on the tingling sensation and environmental factor. Dr. Show me. Yes, I'm here. Question? Yeah. Yes. Um, she said, um, she was asking about what you don't know doesn't hurt you. That's why we have said that it's important to have mammograms done. Usually it's good as you get older, you should have a comprehensive um, medical investigations or tests done so that you are aware of what exactly is wrong because some findings at times are incidental. When it comes to breast cancer, that lump will probably have been there for like 15 years before you can feel it. That's why we always say when you go for imaging, which is the mammogram, the breast ultrasound scan, that you'll be able to detect those things very early and then you can go. The truth about it, like I said, is that um, ignorance or denial honestly is no excuse if there's something wrong with you with the wealth of knowledge with the um with google and so many things around us the jinglings you should be able to detect whatever is wrong with you early if you put your mind at it i believe that a lot of us live in denial that does not exclude even the medical and the caregivers. There are times certain things happen to us and we all kind of, you know, just brush over it lightly when we could have gone further to do a more thorough examination or investigation. So when it now comes to that's for the first part of our question. For the second part, the tingling, it's... Um, I will say, I, I know that I believe that every woman here must have had tingling sensation in their breast at one point in time or the other. But what we say is that um, if it's such that is worrisome or it occurs so regularly, and you feel concerned, then you can go and see the physician and who will probably give you investigations to do just to allay your anxiety and to put your mind at rest. But definitely just having tingling sensation alone is not has breast cancer. So that's it for her question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There's another one for you, doctor. Uh, this person, Jennifer, says, for a patient that has a single mastectomy, I hope I pronounced it right, how often can she go for regular yes. monogram and take a scan? What happens is that um, when one finishes treatment for breast cancer, initially when you have a mastectomy, for the first two years, like on a three monthly basis or four monthly basis, one must go for regular follow-ups. Like we said, at the first two years, it's the time that there's a likelihood there's a recurrence. So in those um, follow-ups, your physician or your specialist will tell you that you have to have a CT chest. For the other breast, yes, you could have a yearly mammogram just to check, like we said, if you do a yearly and there's nothing the first three years, you could do a two yearly um, mammogram. But it's important in the first two years, if you've been diagnosed with breast cancer, to have a um, chest, you know, CT done. Yes, you could have an MRI. What happens is that at times, or not at times, most times, the physicians always think of the affordability of the patient because of financial constraints. Here, we don't have a well-structured insurance, health insurance scheme like they have abroad that can mop up or take up 
most of the cost of the investigations for the patient. So for us here, we try as much as possible to limit the investigations to be done. The um, cheaper one that is also very effective and will give us the result of what we're looking for. So for her, or not for her, for anybody who has had mastectomy, just make sure that you go regularly and I'm sure they will do um, order a CT chest for you. If there's need for um, this thing, for the mammogram, for the other breast, it's done on a yearly basis. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Um, briefly, because uh, we're running out of time, uh, I think there's a Sonny Igbe that would like to make a comment before we come back to the question. Sonny, are you there? Host, please unmute Sonny Igwe. I'll go. Is the host there? Who's the host? I've allowed him. Uh. Okay, Sonny Igwe, are you still there? Okay, so maybe he's no longer there. So I'll go straight to other questions. Someone just said, um, can contra contraceptives, that's the birth control, influence cancer risk? Yes, this question has come up like four times for four different people. And I think this is because you highlighted it as one of the risk factor for causes of cancer. So we know that some women do uh, live on contraceptive to manage, uh, to control birth. So how Hello. do we balance this, doctor? What, um, hello. What yes, me hello. yes, I'm here. What happens is that, like we say, the role of um, contraception right, um, is um, controversial in the sense that a lot of researches has been done. One school of thought believes that, oh, yes, once you start that, it will tip you. But a lot of researches have shown that actually the person probably had been or had had some mutations right from the cells or had been on the borderline before it tipping it over or tipping the person over to having you know breast cancer so what like we say over here because we don't have a good medical past or family history of knowing what happened to our forefathers because there are times when it runs in the family it could skip two generations and come down to the third generation. So what happens is that whatever, um, what do you call it, contraception that, that you're using, all I will say is just ensure that if you um, need to do your mammogram, go for your mammogram. But it still does not stop you from using what you need to use. Worst case scenario, there are different types, you know, of maybe the oral or the um, injections, but if you're in it because you have to, make sure that you go for your regular checks. That's all I have to say. So it doesn't mean that it's everybody that uses contraception that will have breast cancer. So it's just that um, it's a matter of um, some people do, some people probably have had that mutations before. And maybe the um, hormone therapy or contraceptive that they're using just brought out, you know, made it full blown or tipped them over. So that's what I have to say about the contraception that's yep. being used. Okay. So in summary, Ma. In summary, <clears throat> what I'll say is that um, we've all heard from the speaker and from the survivor. What I'll say first is that. Um, Examine your breast, know your breast well. If you find anything, make sure you go for further and a thorough comprehensive investigation. If diagnosed, it's not a death sentence. Medical research has shown that there are lots of medications 
now that can help you live your normal lifespan. Look for survivors that can encourage you. Look for NGOs like Hope that would hold your hand along the journey because it's a journey. And also continue, be encouraged within. If you're a Muslim, speak to your um, religious leader. If you're a Christian, speak to your pastors. Have things, think positively, right? And be ready to fight the battle. Everybody has challenges in life. It's the way you take it that will make you um, a survivor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that's, um, that's, that's, yeah, there's a question for Mrs. Anna Z. A whole lot of people have asked this question. They want, they want to know how much it costs to run the test at Kent. Mrs. Anna Z, are you still there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, did, you, did you hear the question? I did. Yes. Okay. Normally, we have the screening done for 8,000 because things have gone up now. Gladly, a lot of organizations have keyed into free breast examination, free ultrasound scan. What they do is that they pay a certain amount of money, which is a, a million for 120 members. So that when they now come, there's a particular card that we have, which they would, would give to them and be able to tear off their voucher to show that that person came for their screening. So we're not saying it's free, it's not, but a lot of organizations have keyed into paying, we have them on our wall of fame. They have paid a certain amount of money for their staff, their clients, you know, and friends to come and have their breast ultrasound scan done, which also involves clinical breast examination. So we are just trying as much as possible to make sure that women have access to this and come early, honestly speaking, and pleading with us women, please take action. Early detection is key. Don't be afraid. Check your breast regularly. I checked mine to find what, that was in 1995. I was uncomfortable. I went and when I went, it was, it was even in America. They checked me. And I wasn't satisfied. I came back to Nigeria and demanded for a mammogram. That was when I was told that because of my age, the density of my breast at that time will not show anything. That I should just do my breast self-examination or breast ultrasound scan, which I did in Luz. And they certified me free. Immediately I hit 40. I went to do my mammogram. And it was free. Ever since I've been doing regular breast, um, uh, breast self-examination, breast ultrasound scan, and a three yearly, three, uh, every three years, I go for my mammogram. And I've been doing that religiously just to make sure that anything that happens is caught early. I have people in my support group who have not removed their breast and they had cancer because they caught that cancer early. They had chemotherapy done, radiotherapy, but the breast is still there. And this person also works in loose. So early. Have we lost her? Bukala, are you I hearing her? <laughs> Can you hear me? Went off Are you done, man? I said early detection is key. Very, it's very important. Okay. Can Thank you, you so much, Ms. Tanner. Yes. Sorry, the network here in Abuja is bad. Yes, you said so. So thank yes. you so much. This is a very uh, impactful 
an eye-opening session. I particularly have learned a lot and I can also see uh, from the comments on the chat room, uh, every, lots of people are excited and we really have learned a lot. So before I call on our Mrs. Abiodun to give our vote of thanks, I would like to reiterate what the major advice are from the two panelists, just for us to take home. Uh, for this session and to further go and expand on it. So the word of advice out of the session today is that we should do self-breast examination very frequently, almost daily. And from 40 years of age plus should do mammogram tests every year for three consecutive years. After which, if there are no issues, you can then revert to doing it once every two years. We're being encouraged to live a healthy lifestyle. Very important that we have the right to choose whether to live or otherwise. And if that is the case, be deliberate about what lifestyle uh, that we want to live. This is very important. We should remember this all the time. Uh, she also said that um, knowledge is half the battle. To me, this is very important because you really need to know, you need to, need to come from the point of knowledge to be able to deal with any situation. So it's important for us to deliberately seek knowledge about the, the, the disease and we learn how to, to deal with it. Uh, we were also advised to change our bra every day. So it's very important. So this means women should begin to invest in this item and ensure that we change it every day and not repeat it uh, for a very long time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shoumi. Thank you, Mrs. Anaze. Uh, I now call on Mrs. Abiodun to help give the vote of thanks. Every other questions, we will send answers to you uh, privately and we will also share the presentation with the participants. Mrs. Abiodu. Um, I'm not sure she's on the call. I think maybe okay. Larry should just give us the vote of thanks. Larry. Okay. okay, so maybe, sorry, just before Larry comes up, I'll also okay. just like to express that as a corporate, uh, as a responsible corporate organization, uh, one of the things we do for our CSR as well is to ensure that we screen a number of women for free uh, from time to time. So to commemorate this event, we have the approval of the CEO and his leadership team to run a free screening test for about 500 women. We're going to agree on how to uh, choose who and who to pick. So we also send the application out for those who are interested to indicate their interest, just to uh, let us know that so that the participants uh, would also have the opportunity to, for the first right of refusal. Thank you. So, Larry, please. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been an impactful session. I want to particularly thank our speakers, Dr. Shoumi. Thank you very much for um, heeding our call. We appreciate you, even though it was on short notice. We appreciate you, Ma. This is Anozie. Thank you so very much for your support. You're ever supportive of us. And you know that we also love what you do and we continue to support you in and out. Um, Samira Ogutoyibo, you are a, you are, I don't know what, I don't even know what to call you, but uh, we're, we're happy and glad you're able to meet, um, to come in here and share your experience with us. We say that um, the Lord will continue to bless and guide you in everything that you do. We're very thankful. And we say a very big thank you to all our participants as well. We say that um, we will call on you again sometime on, um, on, a, on a different topic. And um, I will hope that um, you'll be able to attend this session. Thank you so much. And we, on behalf of Polaris Bank, we say a very big thank you to everyone. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. We'll be pushing out content to as many participants as um, attended and be updating you with more information as we go on. Thank you.